Uh, we're going to be speaking concerning moving mountains through hope. Open your Bibles with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 17. This is the primary source for uh, this particular lesson. And the account is concerning the transfiguration of Jesus. It is found in three places. That is Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9, and Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. We're going to mainly concentrate on Matthew chapter 17, but we will also reference the Mark and Luke passages because they give a fuller uh, or give more details that Matthew does not cover. But I want us, first of all, just begin by reading the text so that we know for sure what it is that we're going to be discussing. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them in, up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. <clears throat> then answered Peter, and, uh, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, uh, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come. And restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall they also the Son of Man, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So let's go through and notice what is stated here by Matthew here in the text. He begins by saying. After six days. After six days, what, what is that referring to? Well, the context comes from chapter 16, going back to verse 13, when it speaks concerning Jesus and the disciples coming into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they listed off several different things that people said that, uh, as to who they thought Jesus really was. And then he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds by saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus praises him, blesses him for that particular statement because it is coming from God and it is true. And therefore, that is the context. The Caesarea Philippi. And now, after six days, he taketh Peter, James, and John into a high mountain. Now, it's also interesting because... Uh, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 9 and in verse 28, he says that it was about eight days after. And so here's one of those places where the non-believers say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. You can't have any confidence in what the Bible says. Um, Matthew says it's after six days. Luke says it's after eight days. And so you, you can't place any confidence in the scriptures. Well, that's just not, simply not true. The indication seems to be that when Luke says about eight days later, he is using the inclusive language that the Jews would use that any part of a day stands for a whole day. And therefore, you would have a part of the day before and a part of the day after. And therefore, making eight days or about eight days when... Matthew says, after six days. It's just two different ways of saying the same thing, but you have to understand that there were ways and terms that the Jews used that not necessarily everybody would use. And so that is the indication, as it comes from Luke's account anyway. There is no discrepancy here. 
But he speaks concerning the fact that Jesus took Peter, James, and John uh, up into this high mountain. Peter, James, and John, we sometimes describe them as being the inner circle because they are present at certain uh, events that the others are not present as or present with. And so sometimes people ask, well, why, why do you think that he took Peter, James, and John and didn't take all the apostles into the high mountain? Well, that's speculation on our part, but I think at least partially it is because he is fulfilling that which the Old Testament scriptures required in order to confirm a matter that you had to have two or three witnesses and not just the witness of the one who is being charged or the one that uh, the event takes place with. And so by taking Peter, James, and John, he is having two or three witnesses as to what is going to take place here on the Mount of Transfiguration. Deuteronomy chapter 17 and in verse 6, chapter 19, verse 15, and uh, speaks concerning the fact that there are to be two or three witnesses. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus speaks concerning the same thing, concerning the fact if uh, there is an, a, a brother that offends another brother, tras, trespasses against another brother, he says in verse 16, to take one or two more with you, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything may be established. And so Jesus is just doing the same thing. He's going to take two or three with him, and they are going to serve as witnesses concerning what is taking place. After all, if Jesus were up on the Mount of Transfiguration all by himself, how many people are going to believe that Moses and Elijah are there if he doesn't have any witnesses? And so these are going to play a very important part as far as this is concerned. We know from Mark chapter 5, verse 37, that Peter, James, and John are with Jesus when he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. We know from excuse me, from Luke chapter 8 and then verse 35, uh, the, or verse 51 rather, the same thing takes place. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, and Mark chapter 14, verse 33, we have Peter, James, and John that are with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. All the apostles are there at Gethsemane, but Jesus takes Peter, James, and John apart from the other apostles, going a little distance by himself in order to pray. And so those are two events, anyway, uh, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they serve as special witnesses as to what is going to take place on that particular occasion. Jesus is going to tell the Peter, James, and John uh, when they come down from the mountain, that they are not to tell anybody until after the resurrection as to what has occurred here. But we read after the resurrection of Christ, where Peter and John, anyway, are going to tell, they're going to refer to, speak to, concerning the Mount of Transfiguration events. In John chapter 1, verse 14, John says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld His glory. Well, when did they behold His glory? Well, Luke tells us in Luke 9 and verse 31, concerning the transfiguration, that they, Peter, James, and John, saw His glory. So, Luke tells us they saw his glory. John says we beheld his glory, referring to, from all indications, the Mount of Transfiguration, the events that tra take place there with uh, the Father proclaiming, this is my only begotten Son. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 16, uh, is going to be more exact when he speaks concerning this particular event. He says, beginning in verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when, he came, uh, when there came such a voice to him from the exceeding glory 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now we know that God makes this statement concerning Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, after Jesus is baptized. So there's more than one occasion when this statement is made. But here God adds, hear ye him to that occasion. And when Jesus was baptized, he was not on the holy mount. He was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, John the Immerser. And so the indication is Peter is referring to the Mount of Transfiguration here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. But Matthew records that Jesus brought Peter, James, and John into an high mountain. Well, where is this? What high mountain are we talking about? Well... We don't know for sure. Some say it was Mount Tabor, which is just west of the Sea of Galilee in the province of Galilee. Some say that it was Mount Hermon, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the map that I'm showing to you. And uh, so there are at least two different places where it is believed that the Mount of Transfiguration was when Jesus is transfigured. Now, as I stated, some say that they believe it was Mount Tabor. Uh, Mount Tabor is described, anyway, um, as an isolated hill or small mountain rising ab abruptly from gently sloping or level surrounding land. That's the description. Its elevation is 1,886 feet above sea level. And... Uh, I've always wondered, why, why, why was there a discrepancy between Mount Tabor and uh, Mount Hermon as being the location? Now, there are some places in Scripture that are referred to. We just simply don't know where those places are. But why, when it speaks concerning a high mountain, is there such a discrepancy between Mount Tabor and Mount Hermon? Well, I finally came across an explanation. I'd never found one before, but I did... Uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And it made the statement that from the verse, when it speaks concerning the fact that he bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, that many people held to the idea that the apart there was concerning the mountain. The mountain was apart from other mountains. All right? And so they decided it must be Mount Tabor because it's by itself even though it's only 1,886 feet above sea, sea level. Not what you would generally call a high mountain. And uh, I think it was Brother Mike Johnson yesterday was talking about uh, being here in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and uh, how that sometimes don't think of them as being mountains. And uh, I know that we used to laugh at my parents because they bought some mountaintop property in Mont Eagle, Tennessee, 3,000 feet in elevation. Well, at that particular time, we were living in Lyman, Colorado, and we were living on the high plain, and we were over 5,000 feet high, and we were on the flatland. You didn't even make it to the Rockies yet. That was another 85 miles away. And so we would laugh at them as being on their mountaintop property, and we were on a higher elevation than they were. Well, it, it serves to show that sometimes it, perspective comes into play when you're speaking concerning something being a high mountain. Tabor would be a high mountain because it's flat land all around it, and it gently rises up to Mount Tabor. But there seem to be at least two indications as to why it is not Mount Tabor. Uh, the first one is the context brings forth that they are in the region of Caesarea, uh, Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi, if you notice from the map, is just outside of the region of Mount Hermon. Uh, but the context says that that's where they were at, last location being given anyway. Second thing is, Josephus tells us that at the time of Christ, Mount Tabor was a fortress. 
There's no indication of anybody else being around when Jesus is transfigured and nobody else saw what took place there other than Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, and, and God. And so the indication is that it could not have been, would not have been, Mount Tabor, that Jesus is going to be transfigured on. Mount Hermon, though, is described as a cluster of mountains with three distinct summits, each about the same height. And those summits are about 9,232 feet high, five times higher than Mount Tabor. And so it is generally believed, now anyway, that Mount Hermon is the place where the transfiguration took place. Does it matter whether it's Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon or some other mountain? No, it doesn't matter at all. We just have a curiosity of wanting to know where certain events take place and so we try to figure that uh, out. Verse 2, G, uh, Matthew says uh, that Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. The word translated transfigured can also be translated as transformed. It's the word from which we get our word met metamorphosis. And so it just means a change in form. That's the way it's actually defined, a change in form. And uh, yet the description we have here concerning this transfiguration is a change in the appearance of Jesus. Is that the same as a change in form or metamorphosis? Well, yes, it is. It's just speaking concerning a change, and this is going to be a visible change that takes place. It is the very same word that is used in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, there's our word, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so that is the word that we are thinking of here as uh, Matthew gives it. He says, his face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as the light. This was not something that happens in the dark, even though it is night, or at least close to nighttime anyway. Um, Mark tells us in Mark chapter 9 and in verse 3 that his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. Now that description that Mark gives us is interesting if... It takes place on Mount Hermon because most of the year Mount Hermon is covered with snow. And so it may very well be that Mark is speaking concerning the fact that that snow was there at that particular time. We don't know if it was winter time or not, but it could have been. But even if it's not, Mount Hermon is covered with snow most of the year, not all year round, but most of the year. And so the comparison between the snow that is on the ground that hasn't been touched and Jesus' appearance, as far as his clothes are concerned, being as white as snow may very well be what's being referred to here. But his appearance changes. The fashion, Luke tells us, Luke chapter 9, verse 28 and 29, that... Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. Matthew doesn't make mention concerning him going there to pray. Luke says he went there to pray, and the transfiguration took place as he was praying. As he was praying, he is going to be transfigured. And then Luke tells us in verse 29 that his fas the fashion of his countenance was altered. So the transfiguration is going to take place as Jesus is praying there on the mount. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Elias here is uh, the same as Elijah. It's Elijah in the Old Testament from the Hebrew language. It's Elias in the New Testament from the Greek language or the Aramaic language. And so it's the same individual, just different spellings of his name. And again, here's one of those places where they say there's contradictions in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it was Elijah. 
Now it's Elias, but it's not a contradiction. It's just different languages, and therefore its spelling comes out different uh, at various times. But the question arises, how is it that Peter, James, and John knew that it was Moses and Elijah that are with Jesus? Did they pull out their smartphones and look up the pictures concerning Moses and Elijah or pull out their uh, Polaroids to see the old-time pictures that great-great-great-great-great-granddaddy took of Moses and Elijah? No, that's not the case. We don't know how they knew, but we speculate anyway. It could be because of the conversation that takes place. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 9 and in verse 31 that they spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. The word decease there means exodus. So they were talking concerning his exodus that is going to take place at Jerusalem. It's going to involve the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. And so this was the, the discussion. Well, why is it that Moses and Elijah are here? First of all, we need to recognize that they are actually there. This is not such that it is a figment of their imagination that Moses and Elijah are here. First of all, how do you have a figment of the imagination of three different men that are here on this particular occasion? of two men that have been dead for hundreds of years. Uh, we don't, I don't know how you would have that. But anyway, uh, why are they here? Well, again, we don't know for sure because the Scriptures don't tell us, but we can speculate anyway that maybe it had something to do with the fact that both Moses and Elijah are going to have unusual experiences as far as life is concerned, just as Jesus is going to have a unusual experience as far as life is concerned. With uh, Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, we know that Elijah is going to be taken up to heaven without dying, uh, that chariot of fire. And in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and in verse 6, Moses is going to be buried by God, no one knowing where it is that he is buried. No one today knows where Moses was buried. And uh, so maybe it's because of that as to why Moses and Elijah are here. The other possibility is, and more likely anyway, is because they represent two of the three main parts of the Old Testament. Moses, of course, representing the law of Moses. Elijah representing the prophets of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament scriptures are often referred to as the law and the prophets. Jesus does that uh, several different times here in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, chapter, 12, or chapter 7, verse 12, chapter 11, verse 13, and other places. He refers to the law and the prophets. Well, now we have the representative of the law being Moses and the representative of the prophets being Elijah and they are now here discussing concerning the exodus of Jesus. Representing the law of Christ. What were they talking about? Verse 31, Luke chapter 9 says they were talking about his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem, as we've already referred. Verse 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for Moses and one for Elias or Elijah. What did Peter mean by building three tabernacles? Well, we don't know. We don't know what he meant. We know the word tabernacle means tents. When God had Moses build the tabernacle where they were to come and to worship, it was a tent structure anyway that could be moved from place to place. 
Luke tells us in Luke chapter 9, verse 33, that it came to pass as they were departing from him, speaking concerning Moses and Elijah, that Peter said this, that it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles. So the context here is saying that Moses and Elijah are in the process of leaving. And then Peter speaks up and says, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But why did he say that? We don't know. Fact of the matter is, Mark tells us in Mark chapter 9 and in verse 6, that Peter wist not what to say. He didn't know what to say. And in fact, Luke brings out the point that not knowing what to say, this is what he said. Now, if Peter didn't know what to say and didn't know what he said, how can we know what he meant? We can't. If he didn't know, how can we know? But the idea seems to be, anyway, at least a possibility, that he's wanting to delay the exodus of Moses and Elijah. After all, these two men have been dead for hundreds of years. Plus, we're going to find out that they don't understand what Malachi was talking about in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. We'll get to that in a moment. Concerning Elijah must come first. And so it may be that Peter is trying to delay the exodus of Elijah, who has to come first in order for the Messiah, to do what he is intended to do. That may be what it is. But the fact of the matter is, again, we just simply don't know why he said that. Because he didn't know why he said it. It was just something that came out. And we know impetuous Peter, he speaks often before he puts the brain in uh, motion or in gear. And so this may very well be one of those times. Verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. A bright cloud. The Hebrew scholars, or the Jewish scholars, call this bright cloud a Shekinah. A Shekinah. And this is a cloud usually accompanied with bright light. That's what it means. Well, that appears to be what is being spoken of here uh, as it relates to this bright cloud that overshadows Jesus, Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John here on the mountain. And Luke tells us in uh, chapter 9, verse 34, that they feared, Peter, James, and John feared when they entered into the cloud. Several years ago, I was invited when I was looking for a place to preach, I was invited by the church at Lyman, Colorado, our reference at just a moment ago, uh, to come out and to apply for the work there. And they did something very unusual as far as I was concerned. I'd never heard of it being done this way before, but they, it's what they determined. We were living in Florida with my parents at the time, uh, looking for a place to move to. And they said, we would like for you to come out Preach on Sunday, particular Sunday, take a week's vacation, come back and preach for us again the next Sunday. Since you're having to make this long trip out here, uh, make it profitable for you to take a vacation in between. Well, that's what we did. Uh, at that particular time, Adam was the only child that we had. And so we went out there, preached on one Sunday, took a vacation, and came back and preached the next Sunday. Well, on Wednesday, between those two Sundays, we decided that we were going to go to Pikes Peak. Never been to Pikes Peak before. And so we drove all the way up Pikes Peak. And while we were up there on the summit of Pikes Peak, uh, the clouds rolled in. And here, uh, Matthew tells us that the apostles became afraid when the uh, cloud overtook them 
And we somewhat understood what that was about because while we were there on Pikes Peak, this cloud came in and it just encompassed us completely and it began to sleet and they had to close down the road. There was so much sleet on the roads. And so what we expected was going to be a couple of hours being up there. We were up there four hours waiting for the road to open back up so we could come back down. Well, road opened up. We got ready to come back down. We couldn't move. <laughs> the truck wouldn't move. Lo and behold, one of the gaskets for the transmission broke, and transmission fluid was all over the ground. So we had to wait for a tow truck to come up and tow us all the way down Pike Speed. Uh, to Colorado Springs. But it doesn't matter concerning the tow truck, but the part is concerning the cloud that overtook us there on the mount, it caused us to be somewhat concerned, even though we knew what was taking place, and certainly we could understand how it was that Peter, James, and John would be afraid, or could be afraid, when they entered into the cloud, Luke says, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 34. They feared. The word fear here means to be in awe, to have reverence toward, to revere. And so it, it can carry with it the idea of actual fear as we think about fear, but it can also be that of reverence. And so uh, Matthew says that uh, they entered into this bright cloud and Luke tells us that they feared because of it. And then they hear God speak. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. We read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 and 19, where after the Ten Commandments are given there in that chapter, we read concerning the fact that God is speaking to the children of Israel concerning those things. And God speaking to them, we read that the Israelites are fearful, deathly fearful at the voice of God. And so they plead with Moses to speak to them for God so that they don't have to hear the voice of God. This is the very same voice that Peter, James, and John are going to hear on the mount. This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Sometimes we hear individuals say, well, God talked to me last night. Well, I know he didn't, first of all, because he doesn't do that anymore. But secondly, they would not be so calm if that's what took place. It is a fearful thing when God speaks to you. And several different times we have indication from the scriptures that when God spoke literally to the people, they were trembling because they were so fearful of what took place. Well, that's the way it is with Peter, James, and John. They're fearful. Not only because of the bright cloud, not only because of the transfiguration of Jesus, but because of the voice of God himself who is speaking unto them. God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I'm told, I'm not a Greek, Greek scholar, I know very little Greek, even though I went to one of the schools of preaching, but I am told that when God says, I am well pleased, that literally in the Greek, he, in, he is saying, I have always been well pleased with him. There was never even a second where God was not well pleased with Jesus. He has always been well pleasing to hear him. And God says, hear ye him. This is speaking concerning, in preference to the law of Moses, in preference to the prophets, you hear him. You hear the deity in the flesh, the Son of God. That's who you are to listen to. That is who you are to respond to. Verses 6 and 7. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. The 
transfiguration, communicated to Peter, James, and John the honor and the glory that was given to Jesus or that he had throughout this period of time and concerning the fact he is deity in the flesh. He is God in flesh. He's not God the Father. He's God the Word that became flesh. John 1 verse 14 dwelt among us. But he is deity nonetheless. And so Jesus touches them, attempting to comfort them. They know who he is. He comforts them by a touch and then by the gentle voice, be not afraid. John is going to have a similar experience, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. It's not, he's not referring to the transfiguration here, but uh, there he speaks concerning the fact, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So at least twice anyway, Jesus is going to touch John and say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Even concerning all those things John is going to see, those visions he's going to see in the book of Revelation and reveal to us, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Verse 8. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus because Jesus is our only Savior. Jesus is our only mediator. Jesus is our only access to God the Father. John 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is our only means of access to the Father. He's our only hope in this world. He's our only judge in this world. He is our only atonement for man's sins, for our sins. Yes, we need to keep our focus on Jesus, just as Peter, James, and John did as well. Verse 9, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. The words translated vision here means something gazed at, a spectacle, supernatural in nature, says in parentheses, sight, a vision. Some have taken that to mean that this was more like a dream. Well, it wasn't a dream. Moses and Elijah are actually there. Peter, James, and John did not dream that they were in Jesus' presence. They were there. How did that happen? I haven't got the foggiest idea. But I don't have a problem with it. A God who can create everything out of nothing can make sure that Moses and Elijah, who have been dead for hundreds of years, can show up and carry on a conversation with Jesus. If that's what he chooses to do. Jesus tells them they are to tell no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Mark tells us, Mark chapter 9 and in verse 10, that Peter, James, and John are, will question what the rising from the dead means. Over and over again, especially through the book of Mark, it's stated, but over and over again, when Jesus speaks concerning his death, burial, and resurrection, and the things that he is going to suffer at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those things, the apostles didn't understand what he was talking about. And when he speaks concerning them putting him to death, they thought surely he was talking about something else. That's why it takes them by such surprise when Jesus is arrested and put on trial and eventually crucified. That was not what they thought was going to take place. 
They were questioning what the rising from the dead should mean. Sometimes the question is raised, why is it Jesus told them not to tell until after the resurrection? Again, we don't know. Jesus doesn't tell them. He doesn't tell us why. But there is the indication here that they don't really understand the spiritual significance of what's taking place here. And if they don't understand what has taken place here, how can they tell it to others so as to teach them? They can't teach what they don't know. And so it appears that Jesus doesn't want them telling something that they don't understand. But after the resurrection, after the resurrection, they will understand. And they will, at that point, begin to tell others concerning these things. Verse 10, the disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Again, they don't, they don't know why this has taken place. The connection, of course, here is that uh, Elijah is the one from... That's not where I want, sorry. Press the right buttons. Here we go. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, that uh, Moses, or Elijah rather must come first, and therefore there are certain things that they expected that Elijah was going to do before the Messiah would come, and the scribes have indicated from Malachi chapter 4 that those things have to take place first, and they don't understand. Elijah wasn't here very long. How could he accomplish all those things that were to be spoken of, those things that Elijah was supposed to do? And Jesus said, it is true that Elias must come first in order to restore all things. Elijah did have to come first. But Jesus says in the very next verse, Elijah did come. And they didn't know who he was. They didn't respect him. They didn't follow him. They didn't obey him. And they put him to death. Jesus is going to make it plain to them that was John the Baptist. He was not literally Elijah, but he was in the spirit of Elijah. He was was, uh, in the capabilities, if you will, of Elijah. And uh, so it is that Jesus is telling them that Elijah has already come, and that was John the Baptist. And as they put him to death, so they're going to put me to death. All right, real quickly. Moving mountains through hope. What are some things that we have as far as hope is concerned? Let me suggest to you that we have the hope which means expectation, desire, anticipation. Peter says it's a lively hope, a living hope, something in which uh, is no longer dead, no longer a dead hope. And so what is this lively hope? Well, we have a hope of the resurrection. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter of the Apostle Paul. We have the hope of reassurance. Peter, when he is writing 2 Peter, is reassuring the brethren that these things concerning the Messiah are true. We say, he says, we were eyewitnesses concerning these things, and he specifically refers to the transfiguration. We were eyewitnesses. We were ear witnesses. We heard the voice of God ourselves. We heard the discussion that took place between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And so he is reassuring them that these things literally did take place. They are not hearsay. Well, that's the same reassurance we need, isn't it? We need reassurance that the things that we hear and have heard concerning Jesus are in fact true. We have the hope of reassurance. We have hope of strength to overcome the valleys of reality. You know, with 
virtually every time that we have reference concerning mountaintop experiences in the scriptures, immediately following that, we have valleys of despair that take place. You have concerning uh, Moses at Mount Sinai. Moses is receiving the law from God, and yet the people down below are being rebellious, having had Aaron to fashion that golden calf, and they're dancing around it, worshiping it rather than worshiping God. The valley of reality. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua is going to, and the children of Israel are going to be defeated at Ai. Why? Because Achan took of the accursed thing when they took the city of Jericho. And therefore, sin was in the camp. God would not let them proceed any farther with his backing. You have concerning Elijah himself. He's just defeated the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He comes back down, Jezebel says, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be as dead as those 450 prophets of Baal. What does Elijah do? He runs away. Runs away from Jezebel. Over 150 miles he runs away to get away from her. And God asks him, why are you here? Elijah says, I just want to die. Elijah didn't want to die. If he wanted to die, all he had to do was stay there. Jezebel said, I'll make sure you're dead in 24 hours. And he ran away. No, he was exhausted. He was worn out. But there was still work for him to do. God's going to send him back to do work. He's in the valley of reality. But he has work to do. We have the hope of strength to overcome. We have the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation. The crown of life when this life is over. The hope of heaven. Truly, we can move mountains through hope.